This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. During the late 1960s, thousands of curiosity seekers lined up to catch a glimpse of the legendary Iceman, a mysterious creature reportedly half man and half ape entombed in a block of solid ice. But when the police began to investigate just who or what was in the frozen tomb, the Iceman vanished. At the age of 10, Tom Vaughn landed at a children's home, the innocent victim of his parents' bitter divorce. Tom was absolutely miserable until he met a boy named Brendan, whose sense of humor and irrepressible spirit helped Tom survive his darkest hours. Tonight, Tom would like to thank the friend he hasn't seen since 1957. In 1953, at the height of the Cold War, a government scientist named Frank Olson plunged to his death from a hotel window, an apparent suicide. 22 years later, it was revealed that just days before he died, Frank Olson had been unwittingly dosed with a hallucinogenic drug LSD as part of a secret CIA experiment. Join me as we begin a fascinating new season. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. As you can see, gentlemen, these are not ideal circumstances in which to view the exhibit. On a chilly December evening in 1968, a promoter named Frank Hansen led two renowned scientists into an isolated barn in southeastern Minnesota. Mr. Hansen, is the exhibit ever shown outside the trailer? No, it is always shown only in the trailer. Ivan Sanderson and Dr. Bernard Huvelmans were experts in the esoteric field of cryptozoology, the study of hidden species. They had come to examine a peculiar artifact that had fallen into Hansen's possession. Gentlemen, here is the exhibit. The two scientists were astonished. Entombed in a block of solid ice was a mysterious creature that appeared to be half man, half ape. These are actual photographs of the Iceman. Sanderson and Huvelmans departed, convinced that this bizarre sideshow attraction had genuine scientific value. But within just a few short weeks, the enigmatic creature had vanished, and with it, any future opportunity for study. Who, or rather what, was the Iceman? Most people assumed it was just what it was purported to be. An entertaining illusion created by a master showman. Sanderson and Huvelmans disagreed. They theorized that the Iceman was in reality a prehistoric ancestor of man that had somehow survived into the 20th century. This machine predates the Model T. It is one of the oldest tractors in the world, revolutionized farming. In 1967, Frank Hansen was traveling the State Fair circuit, exhibiting an antique mechanical contraption that he built as a first gas-powered tractor. Beautiful to look at. At one stop, Frank was allegedly approached by a mysterious, soft-spoken stranger. The following recreations are based upon published accounts. Sir, may I have a word with you, please? I certainly. I find what you're doing here, sir, is fascinating. I have an exhibit that I think would benefit from your expertise. Please, give me a call. It might be worth your while. Thank you. I 
Thank you. Hansen later met the stranger at a refrigerated warehouse in some unknown location. What you are going to see belongs to me. How I came by it is, uh, is my business, and we need not discuss that at the moment. Is there some reason it needs to be kept in such cold? I think that will be obvious to you in just a few moments. Is it real? Where did you get this from? Frank Hansen knew a golden opportunity when he saw one. He agreed to take the creature on the road and build it as an educational exhibit. Over the next two years, the Iceman became a star attraction at carnivals and state fairs throughout the Midwest. Thousands of people were fascinated, but no one seemed to know what it was. Fake. Zookeeper Bob Szapleski saw the Iceman when he was 18 years old. What I was looking at was not made out of latex. It was not made out of rubber. It did not appear to be a man-made thing. It appeared to be something. But I, I, you know, as far as my opinion, I don't know what I was looking at. But I, I'm sure I was looking at something dead. Environmentalist David Rivard viewed the exhibit in 1968. Uh, the first thing that went through the average person's mind was that uh, this was not a, a wax animal that he had there. This was not a uh, uh, something that was uh, a machine. Um, it was some kind of a live, formerly live animal that was in the block of ice. Dr. Terry Cullen is a zoological and veterinary researcher. And uh, I had long been an aficionado of sideshows and going to see them for mostly curiosity reasons. It was always enjoyable. You always had a great time trying to find out what they were doing and how they had it, what they did to fool the public, and about 99% of the In time... In the past, Terry Cullen has been reluctant to deal with the media. He agreed to this interview to try to clear up past inaccuracies about the Iceman. For various and sundry reasons. Oh, my God. Cullen first saw the Iceman when he was 17. He says a creature appeared to be a six-foot-tall adolescent male. It was covered with medium-length hair and had highly visible follicles. Cullen also noticed a traumatic injury to the left side of the Iceman's face. There was a noticeable odor coming out of this casket. The one thing that there is no doubt in my mind about is that the thing that I observed, the carcass that I observed, was in fact made out of some sort of flesh. Well, young man, you've been here before, haven't you? Yes, I have. Well, Terry I Cullen was hooked. He returned to the exhibit time and time again. On one occasion, Cullen snuck in a magnifying glass. Frank Hansen has seemed increasingly agitated with each visit, so Terry made sure he was discreet. There was something of a death grimace on the face. The uh, upper lip was pulled back a bit. I was able to observe uh, all four incisors, which were very large, very squarish, very much like an orang's incisors. Whatever this was, it was important enough to get the necessary scientific personnel in there to view it, to establish that either, yes, this is some form of unknown creature, or no, this is a fake somehow cleverly constructed from the parts of other animals or whatever materials they were using. Missing link, huh? Yeah, I can't wait for you to see this. Kid, I've been to a lot of sideshows. These things are always fake. No, this one's amazing. I think this one's real. <laughs> Don't expect too much. Yeah, go on. Over the next few weeks, Terry Cullen tried to entice several scientific experts to view the creature. Eventually, he convinced an anthropologist from the University of Minnesota. He was in there perhaps 10 to 15 minutes, came back out again, and he started walking past where I was standing, and he was 
It's sort of a dreamy look on his face. I came zipping up to him. And... Well, what'd you think? It's amazing. Yeah? I mean, well, tell me. Uh, no, I can't. It's, it's really amazing. What'd you see out of it? I mean, what did you... Thank you. Yeah. I, th <laughs> I remember being practically close to tears from frustration that I had finally gotten someone who at least had some credibility in the, the field of anthropology to look at this thing. And I couldn't even get six words out of the gentleman. Now, the reasons for that, I can't even speculate on. At that point, I decided I would have to pursue other avenues. In the end, it was Terry Cullen who convinced Sanderson and Hoovelmans to examine the Iceman. Sanderson and Hoovelmans were both convinced that, in fact, this carcass was the genuine carcass of some unknown form of, of animal or hominid. In May of 1969, Sanderson and Hoovermans published their findings in a tabloid magazine for science buffs. National attention quickly descended upon Frank Hansen, and before long, the authorities took an interest in Hansen and the frozen carcass. In the summer of 1969, the local sheriff stopped by Hansen's farmhouse. There's some people that think that thing you got is the real McCoy. Well, of course they're supposed to. Look, Frank, if it is, I've got a couple of problems with it. Taking a cadaver over state lines is illegal. And if it's the real McCoy, how did he get dead? Listen, you can come with me and we'll look at it together. No, You'll no, see no, that no, it's no, a no, look, look. What, what say I bring a pathologist back tomorrow morning? Is that OK with you? Well, sure, that's OK. 10 o'clock OK? That's fine. OK. See you then. Sure. Sure. That very night, Frank Hansen allegedly beat it out of town, taking his controversial exhibit with him. A few months later, Hansen was back on the circuit with a replica of the mysterious creature. The whereabouts of the real ice man are still unknown. This thing may one day be understood by us as a genuine uh, object, as a, a true representative of something primitive and manlike that is still living today. If, under other circumstances, this kind of thing is found and described and matches those extensive descriptions by Sanderson and Hovelmans, then at that point in time, someday in the future, we would know that this was the real thing that they saw in 1968. What was the Iceman? A primitive human-like species that managed to survive until present day? An elaborate hoax pulled off by a professional huckster, or perhaps some unfortunate soul who died an untimely death and ended up as a sideshow attraction. Frank Hansen may be the only person who can answer these questions, and he isn't talking. Despite repeated attempts to have him share his story, Hansen declined to participate in this broadcast. For now, it seems the legend of the Iceman must remain just that. A legend. When we return, perhaps someone in our audience will be able to reunite two childhood friends. At any moment, any one of us can meet a person who changes our lives forever. In 1956, two 10-year-old boys named Tom and Brendan met in a Catholic children's home in New York City. By an odd coincidence, they both had the same last name, Vaughn. Not so coincidentally, they both needed a friend. I believe that Brendan saved my life because he did have such a unique way of helping me put things into their proper perspective. I don't know what would have happened during that first year had Brendan not been there to, uh, uh, to tickle my funny bone. How Tom Vaughn came to be in the children's home is a story in itself. His mother, Jean, and his father had gone through a bitter divorce. By 1954, Jean was hiding Tom and his little brother, Dick, from their father. 
The boys bounce from rooming houses to foster homes, living in nine different places in less than two years' time. Yes? Finally, they ended up in the Bronx, in a basement apartment supervised by a kindly landlord, Sonny Chris Kulo. I came about the apartment. Nevertheless, Jean Vaughn's life grew increasingly chaotic. The boys were usually left to fend for themselves. Who is it? It's Mr. C, pal. Yeah, your mother called. She said she's going to be late. When's she going to be home? Uh, a couple hours. Uh, did you have something to eat yet? Oh, we're about to eat. Oh, yeah, well, then maybe you don't... Sonny kept an eye on the boys. In fact, he and his wife wanted to become their legal guardians. But Catholic Charity okay. stepped in. They were finally convinced that Jean was an unfit mother. They pressured her to send the boys to a children's home. Tom and Dick were taken to the Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Home for Children in the Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. As we emerged from the car, there was an opportunity for me to take flight and to run down the street and run away. And yet I knew that there was nothing I could do and that I had to face what was about to transpire. Come along, boys. Come along. You know, I had to be in charge of Dick, and there was no way in front of all of these strangers that I could tell them how I felt. Uh, or what I was feeling, so I was trapped. And I think maybe it's time now to, to go and get unpacked and settled. When the moment came for the boys to tell their mother goodbye, Tom was paralyzed with fear, barely able to move, and totally unable to speak. I distinctly <laughs> remember yelling to myself, Mom, don't leave us, don't allow this to happen. Um, don't allow them to take us from you. I love you, Dickie. I was so angry and I was feeling so much pain and, and so much of a sense of loss that I was just happy to turn from that scene and walk out of the room. For so long, Tom and Dick had been one another's primary source of strength. Now, although they could still see their mother together on weekends, at the home itself, they were forced to live apart. Tom sank deeper and deeper into misery and turned a sullen face to his new peers. Good evening, boys. I'd like you to meet Tommy. Tommy, these are going to be your new dorm mates. This is Brendan, Jerry, and Michael. Tom could never have guessed that this boy, Brendan Vaughn, would be his salvation. Brendan simply refused to let Tom retreat into his shell. What's your name again, Tommy? Where are you from? How long you been here? He started talking to me, but I really wasn't in the mood for any conversation whatsoever and sat there kind of picking at my food. What happened? Cat got your tongue? Well, after we left the, the uh, dinner table, uh, I went back up to my room, and this Brendan character had the bunk next to mine. What's your last name? Vaughn. Bon. Hmm. It's the twin, so that's my last name. How do you spell it? V-A-U-G-H-N. I spell my little differently. V -A -U. He had big freckles and curly brown hair and had the Irish accent. Okay, boys, lights out. Tuck in. Come on. It wasn't uh, too long before he had me opening up, and uh, he, he had a mischievous uh, manner about him that, uh, and, and devilish, to say the least. Tommy, tell me when you fall asleep, okay? What? Tell me when you fall asleep. How can I tell you when I'm asleep, when I'm already asleep? Don't he would do me. silly little things to try and make me uh, feel not so sad or depressed. Good night, Brendan. Tommy. Why did God make you? Brendan helped Tom in other ways as well. Why did God make you? Especially in catechism class, where the children were required to deliver their answers by rote. Brendan uh, whispered the answer to me. 
And Tommy once again, he saved my Thank life you. there because I'm certain that I would have been in serious trouble if I had not had that like simple answer. So we could love and serve him. Perfect! You know what this is? A rock? No, a piece of the Blarney Stone. What's a Blarney Stone? It's a magic rock high up on the castle wall in I. And if you kiss it, you'd have good luck. This constant. Uh, conjoling by Brendan put a perspective on, on where we were and the fact that it wasn't so bad. I mean, the treatment there was wonderful. And he began to draw me towards that perspective of what was actually going on there and that it was kind of a fun place. So he really, uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, uh, um, showed me the way to uh, overcome my depression. A year and a half after Tom and Brendan met, the inevitable happened. What are you doing? I'm packing my suitcase. Why? Sister said to get ready to leave. To pack my suitcase and get ready to leave. Brendan was very quiet because I think he was scared and afraid and didn't know where he was going or what was happening. I do remember Brendan walking down that long hall and wanting to run after him, but once again being paralyzed uh, by my inability to do that. I mean, I just couldn't show that kind of emotion. So you take care, you hear? Eventually, Tom and his brother Dick were sent to live with their father in Montana. Their mother, Jean, whose problems had finally overwhelmed her, died in 1985. Tom Vaughn is now a successful investment banker in Colorado, happily married and the father of an 11-year-old daughter. Tom credits his young friend Brendan with changing his outlook and his life. There hasn't been a, a week go by in the last 36 years that I haven't thought of him. I didn't have an opportunity to tell him how much I appreciated what he did for me. And I think it's, it's my turn to make him smile, um, perhaps to uh, kiss that uh, Blarney Stone just one more time. Within minutes of our broadcast, Brendan Vaughn called our phone center from his home in New York. We connected him with Tom Vaughn in Denver, and finally Tom had his chance to say thank you. The two men agreed to meet in Manhattan on March 6, 1994, at 8.30 a.m. sharp. Tom came outside early, so he'd be there to greet Brendan. But Brendan, same old Brendan, surprised him. Yeah? Well, relatively, we're the same height. Yeah. It seems like we haven't uh, been apart. He still has the gregariousness uh, and the uh, power in his voice, and uh, still seems to have the same approach to things. So I don't think he's changed all that much. <laughs> Brendan had brought along his sister, Noreen. In the hotel lobby, they met Tom's wife and daughter. For Brendan, who is divorced and has no children, Hi. it was like finding a long lost family. Hello. It's really a nice feeling. I mean, I was really shocked. You know, when you sit down and say, well, you know, why, you know, what have I done in my life? And what, uh, you know, what have you accomplished? And you can't say, well, I touched anybody's life. I haven't done anything. Uh, and then all of a sudden this pops up. It's, it's really flattering. It's really amazing. <laughs> Brendan and Noreen, who was also at the children's home, spent the morning reminiscing with Tom. Well, it was hard to tell the nuns apart. <laughs> well, I didn't care as long as you went in the water. I, I was so bad that they were trying everything to try to get me to be good. As soon as we got into that conversation, it was like it had only taken place, our last conversation had taken place the day before, so it was uh, very nice. I'm the captain, I gotta go see you know, the honor guard. Finally, Tom's childhood wounds are beginning to heal. 
the two boys, best friends before they were separated more than 35 years ago, made an instant connection to their past and to one another. It's represented closure uh, for a chapter in my life that had been very, very difficult. And so coming here, facing him, finding him, being here today is a way to let go of that. And, and so I'm very pleased about that. Tom Vaughn and Brendan Vaughn now hope they will hear from other alumni of the Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Home for Children, the very children, all now in their 40s and 50s, with whom they once shared so much. Next, a government scientist falls to his death from a hotel window. Was it suicide or murder? In the early morning hours of November 28, 1953, a crowd gathered outside of New York's Hotel Statler. A man had apparently jumped to his death from a 13-story window. The victim was later identified as a government scientist named Frank Olson. Frank Olson left behind a wife and three small children. His sons are now grown men and are still trying to find out what really happened to their father. Now, in a final desperate appeal, they hope someone in our audience can help solve this baffling mystery. Frank Olson died at the height of the Cold War tensions. At the time, our leaders here in Washington, D.C. faced the very real possibility that we might be attacked by the Soviet Union. Just an hour's drive from where I'm standing, the country's technological brain trust was working at a feverish pace to develop a new generation of weapons. Frank Olson was heading one of these projects when he died. Forty years later, the questions surrounding his death demand answers. Frank Olson worked at Fort Detrick, Maryland, headquarters for the military's Biological Warfare Research and Development Program. Frank was an expert in aerobiology, the delivery of deadly viruses and infectious microorganisms via sprays and aerosol cans. My father was a research scientist who was involved with uh, germ warfare, uh, associated with the SO division, which stood for Special Operations. That was the most top secret uh, kind of uh, uh, research that was done out at Fort Detrick. Uh, and some of that research was being done in coordination with uh, the CIA. At Fort Detrick, Frank Olson earned the respect and admiration of his coworkers. Then in November of 1953, Frank went to a three-day conference with some of his colleagues and came home a changed man. The weekend after that meeting, my father was severely depressed. He felt that he had done something terribly wrong, and he told my mother that uh, he had done uh, something wrong, but he couldn't tell her what. And she asked him uh, whether or not uh, he had broken security, and he indicated that he would never do such a thing, but he felt that he had done something terribly wrong. Frank's boss, Vincent Rouette, told the Olsons he believed Frank was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Just before Thanksgiving, Rouette took Frank to New York for treatment. In New York, Frank shared a hotel room with Dr. Robert Lashbrook, a CIA scientist. Nearly a week passed before Frank's family heard from him. Do me a favor. Would you kiss the kids for me? My father seemed a little, uh, a little more peaceful than he had. He made a call to my mother to say he was all right. Bob, it's getting late. I'm going to turn the TV off. They went to sleep fairly early, about 11. And the next thing we know from Lashbrook is that he was awakened by the sound of crashing glass. Right? God. Frank Olson was dead at the age of 43. Investigators later determined that he had either jumped or fallen to his death. I remember as a nine-year-old, and actually for years after that, I was completely stumped and dumbfounded by trying to resolve that alternative. I mean, it's a big difference between fall or jump, and I couldn't understand how either of them could have occurred. 
the Olsons weren't alone. The night manager of the hotel found Frank's death suspicious as well. I rushed outside to find Frank Olson, eyes wide open, looking straight at me, trying to tell me something. Okay. Okay, buddy. They were definitely trying Just to speak, come, come, come. but there was nothing coming Help, out come. but grumbles. Just stay with us, okay? He was in terrible condition. Come on, buddy. And by this time, then the ambulance came. And I stepped back because now I had to find out where he came from. So I looked up the building, and finally I saw a little movement of a window shade. Now when I concentrated on that, then I see that the window shade was stuck through a broken window. Armand Pastor immediately took the police to room 1018A. And here is Lashbrook sitting on a john in his skivvies. And the police start to question him. And I heard him what say, well, all I heard there was a crash. See. I woke up. I walked What's around the on? room to look around. Look at this in here. Nobody ever jumps through a window. They open the window and they, and they go out. Not dash through a shade through. and a sheer drape. You know, there's no sense to that. 22 years would pass before Frank Olson's family heard Armin Pastor's account. All they were told in 1953 was that Frank had suffered a nervous breakdown and committed suicide. Then in 1975, a government commission was formed to investigate past abuses committed by the CIA. Among other incidents, the official report made mention of a scientist who had plunged to his death from a hotel room 10 days after being dosed with LSD. That scientist turned out to be Frank Olson. Over the next year and a half, the Olson family received a formal apology from President Gerald Ford and a check from the government for $750,000. The Olsons also met with then CIA chief, William Colby. As a result of meeting with uh, William Colby at the CIA, we were given uh, what was supposedly a complete set of documents relating to uh, the events of uh, the last uh, nine days of my father's life. I should have the results back on the toxicology tests. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned that uh, he had gone to uh, a retreat in Deep Creek Lake uh, in Western Maryland with a group of other scientists. The principle of the meeting was that they were going to be discussing ongoing research. But in fact, uh, there were agents in the CIA who were meeting with them who decided that uh, they were going to uh, give them uh, each a dose of LSD uh, without their knowledge or consent and then see what their reaction was. Anyone for a drink? The Olsons learned that the LSD was slipped into an after-dinner liqueur by either Sidney Gottlieb, head of the CIA's technical services staff, or his deputy, Dr. Robert Lashbrook. Thank you. The CIA reportedly feared that the Soviet Union might employ LSD to produce anxiety or terror in captured CIA agents. Gottlieb believed that his test would help prepare American operatives for that eventuality. Thank you, Sidney. Just what I needed. The laced drinks were served to eight of the ten scientists present. Some of them, including Frank Olson, were not told about the test. The first day we were there. Within an hour, the LSD began to take effect. Gentlemen, are we all feeling a bit strange? When Gottlieb informed the drug-induced gallery that their drinks had been spiked with LSD, Frank Olson became incensed. What? Wait a minute. We're having an experiment here. You put a drug in our drinks. Yes, yes. We're in the middle of an ex experiment. We understood that my father uh, was quite agitated and was having a serious confusion uh, with separating reality from, uh, from fantasy. Less than a week later, Frank made his ill-fated trip to New York, 
supposedly suffering from a nervous breakdown. Well, Frank, how are we feeling today? I feel lousy, doctor. Frank was taken to see Dr. Harold Abramson, an LSD expert who worked extensively with the CIA. It's been continuing for about a week Look now. Look at me, please. You were saying that you weren't resting very well. Is that improving? Or no, not? I'm not resting. I haven't been able to sleep for over a week. Accompanying Frank were Robert Lashbrook and Frank's boss, Vincent Rouet. Frank, sit down. For I, I don't want to sit down. I can't sit down. Frank remained in New York and over the next several days made repeated visits to the doctor's office. Someone has been following me. From the documents we have, it's impossible to deduce what was accomplished in those meetings, and you certainly don't see any, any indication that a treatment process was occurring. You can suspect that some kind of assessment process was going on, the purpose of which was more to protect the CIA's interest than it was to help my father. Apparently, the pattern continued in the immediate aftermath of Frank's death. For some unexplained reason, Robert Lashbrook never phoned for help. However, he allegedly did make a disturbing call, which was overheard by the hotel operator. In those days, you know, all the calls were manual. You called the operator, and you told her what number you want, and she would dial it for you. And then she'd listen to see that you got connected. When the man in the room called this number, he said, well, he's gone. And the man on the other end said, well, that's too bad. And they both hung up. I mean, what's more suspicious than that? You don't have to be a genius to figure out that there's something amiss. Or who said, De Hamlet said, there's something rotten in Denmark? I mean, I knew there was something rotten at the Pennsylvania Hotel that night. I'd like to emphasize at the beginning that there are many things that we still don't know about the events surrounding my father's death. When the news first broke about Frank's suicide, Armand Pastor contacted the Olson family and told them about the mysterious phone call. The Olsons immediately began to suspect that Frank had not taken his own life. I believe that what happened was that my father was considered a security risk, that the CIA either uh, formally or informally decided that it was in, in the country's or in the agency's best interest to have my father t either take his own life or that uh, he needed to be eliminated. And I'm gonna I'll do everything that you tell me to do. I promise you. One of the nights that my father was up in New York, uh, he was having delusions that he was hearing voices, and uh, in the middle of the night he woke up and went uh, and threw all of his identification out and his money. All right, get rid of all of my money and my identification. Okay. You have to see that as an obvious sign of uh, a suicidal tendency. Well, to keep my father uh, in a 10th floor window, which uh, in a 10th floor room, which actually was 13 stories off the ground, uh, to me is the epitome of irresponsibility. In 1993, Frank's widow Alice passed away. Eric and Nils had their father's body moved to rest beside her. But before Frank was reinterred, they asked forensic scientist Professor James Stars to perform an autopsy. Quite frankly, we had no idea what the condition of the remains would be after 41 years. We were delighted uh, that the remains were in perfect condition for our analysis. As part of his overall investigation, Professor Stars and his colleagues went to the old Hotel Statler, which is now known as the Hotel Pennsylvania. The first thing that Professor Stars looked for was evidence that Frank had indeed smashed through a window. The medical examiner in New York, who did an external examination back in 1953, said there were multiple lacerations on the face and neck. There were none. I mean, I mean, zero. Soon after that finding was made public, Lashbrook changes his story, which he's held to for 40 years, and suddenly now starts saying that he can't remember whether the window, in fact, was open or closed. The window was completely gone. There was a little glass around the, on, the, on the fringes, and the shade was stuck out through the glass. At some point, he had to hit some glass. I cannot believe that he wouldn't have gotten cuts in the lower extremities 
of his body on the front of the legs, we don't find any cuts. Professor Stars did find that Frank had sustained extensive injuries to his head, chest, and right leg. When you have fractures as massive and in different locations as these fractures clearly are, they indicate a tremendous amount of force that caused those. Well, clearly he was falling from the building. If he struck his foot and that caused the massive injuries, the question for us is, well, how did he get the massive injuries on his chest? If he hit his chest, well, how did he get the massive injuries on his foot? If it was a glancing blow against an abutment on the way down, the likelihood of, of his having the massive injuries from a glancing blow is very remote. What happened to Frank Olson? Professor Starr's analysis is not yet complete, but his preliminary findings paint a disturbing scenario. It's getting worse. Clearly, in this case, there is foul play on the part of the CIA in giving him LSD in the first place and making a guinea pig out of him the way they did. But foul play of the homicide type, that's what we're in this business to try to find out. As I say, the evidence is beginning to mount. I looked at this case for um, 14 months, and I found no evidence that points directly to murder. I don't rule it out, but I found no evidence that indicated me to, um, that that would happen. And I have to tell you, it seems unlikely to me that the CIA people in the context of the 1950s would have killed a colleague. I can see them doing something like this against a Soviet or an enemy, but not a colleague. I think the Olson case must be resolved. That family deserves to know. I think the American people now deserve to know the truth of what happened. It's been a long time ago. They don't have to hide behind their classified documents, behind all of their stealth information, and their sleazy little James Bond stories. Tell us what happened to Frank Olson. Congressman Trafficant is now calling for an official investigation into the death of Frank Olson. Perhaps after more than 40 years of secrecy, the true story behind this Cold War mystery will finally be told. of a man suspected of murder. April 24th, 1994. Along the Christina River in Delaware, authorities close in on a dangerous fugitive who has been wanted on murder charges for more than six years. The suspect is 38-year-old Larry Donald George, a former army enlisted man and self-styled survivalist. You know you're not supposed to be here. Where you been? It's none of your business. You On February 12th, 1988, George confronted his estranged wife, Geraldine, at her home in Talladega, Alabama. Look, you're gonna listen to me. You're gonna listen to me. <laughs> Geraldine ran next door for help. Larry George followed. Geraldine's neighbor, Janice Morris, was shot once in the chest. Larry, please stop. Next, Larry allegedly took aim at Geraldine. Janice! Janice's boyfriend, Ralph Swain, heard the commotion and ran downstairs. <laughs> Ralph Swain was shot in the back of the head. Janice Morris was pronounced dead at the scene. Ralph Swain was rushed to a local hospital where he died a short time later. Geraldine George survived the shooting, but was left paralyzed from the waist down. For more than six years, she lived with a bitter knowledge that her husband was still at large. After the most recent broadcast of the story, the authorities were contacted by an Unsolved Mysteries viewer the viewer claimed to have seen Larry George fishing on the banks of the Christina River in Wilmington, Delaware. Three days later, two police detectives were dispatched to the area. 
For our cameras, the officers recounted their dramatic meeting with Larry George. This is where we first encountered Larry George at, right here. We began a conversation with him about fishing. At this time, he wanted to take us over here to where his pole was in the water and show us uh, exactly where he was fishing at. We got about here, and we started talking again about fishing. And it was at this time where myself and Detective Pinkett made eye contact and I identified myself as a police officer to Larry. At this time, a brief struggle ensued right about here. We all three fell to the ground here. We got back to our feet, still struggling. And at that point, we just turned and threw Larry into the water. While the officers regrouped, George attempted to flee downriver. But backup units quickly cornered him, and he surrendered without further struggle. At George's campsite, police found a makeshift bunker, complete with generator, heater, television, and stove. The subsequent discovery of several weapons, including a spear gun and a sawed-off shotgun, led investigators to believe that George had been prepared to resist arrest by whatever means necessary. He knew he was wanted for murder. He wasn't going to be taken alive if he would have uh, put himself in his hideout. And if we'd have discovered it, it he probably would have had gunfire and officers would have been hurt. On April 27, 1994, Larry Donald George was extradited to Alabama to face charges of murder and attempted murder. It was a long-awaited moment for Geraldine George and the families of Ralph Swain and Janice Morris. They're delighted that this is kind of bringing this to an end, and I can understand their feelings about the situation simply because it's been a long six years, and really not knowing where he is and, and uh, if he would show back up. I'm sure that has brought a lot of discomfort and a lot of sleepless nights to them, so I, I know that they're very happy that they, this is uh, shortly being drawn to a close. Join me next Sunday for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.